Hi everyone, um, I'm just coming in and doing uh, these tutorials rather than being in the classroom where there is too much disruptions and gaps. I'm going to do them in my uh, professional development time uh, to help you guys along and be able to follow along. Uh, I will be going at a faster pace, um, but it is a recorded video so you can stop it, pause it, rewind it, do all sorts of things if you need to. Um, what we're going to do is create our second exercise, which is the Tomb of Doom. So the first thing we do is create a sword where we learn a little bit about the navigation of Blender and how it all works. In this one, we're going to be uh, creating a 3D object, a very simple 3D object. And we're going to be uh, putting in seams and unwrapping the 3D object in a 2D work area and UV editing to create a map that we can use to create a texture for our object. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to delete the cube because we do not need the cube. I've got my origin or my uh, 3D cursor right in the middle of the world origin, which is where I want it. Shift A, I'm bringing in a cylinder. And then what I want to do is go to front view. So that's numpad one. I'm going to scroll in with my mouse so I can get a closer look. I'm holding the shift and middle mouse button to move around like that. If I just hold down the middle mouse button, it's going to orbit. I was in front view, front orthographic. I want to hit tab to go into edit mode. And what I want to do is uh, move everything up in edit mode. G. So I'm grabbing everything, Z the direction, and typing in 1. GZ1 has brought up my whole object. And I'm going to hit tab to go back into object mode. And you can see the origin of the object is now at the floor. <coughs> I prefer doing this uh, for many reasons. Uh, one is because we do a lot of game design. Um, just having everything with its origin at the floor makes it easy to align everything, to snap everything in. Uh, you'll probably even see some game characters which have their origin point at their feet. Same sort of reason. So they always keep at the ground level. What I'm going to do is scale this object now in object mode. So I was going to press S to scale. Z to be the direction. And then I'm going to type in 0.5. So 0.5, that is pretty much the shape I want to start off with. Now what I want to do is I want to dome the ceiling. So I hit tab to go into uh, edit mode. I hit three on my alphanumeric keys. And I'm selecting the top. Now when I press three, it's swap between vertex to face mode, which you can see up the top here as well. And this one in the middle here is edge. But on your numeric keys, one alphanumeric key, so that's the number keys above your letter keys, one, two, and three swaps between those different modes. So by clicking on three is my shortcut key to select the top face. What I want to do next is press E to extrude. And luckily, just as I started dragging it upwards on the, with the mouse, I can see my middle. Um, if I the same as I was clicking the middle mouse button or pressing Z for the direction, the guidelines come up, which is exactly what we want. And then S to scale, I'm scaling it in a little bit. Go to front view so I can get a better look at the shape. I want to have a good shape. E to extrude. Left click. S to scale into the new position, left click. I'm saying left click because if I just move it to a new position and right clicked, it just snaps back down. It goes to the origin which it was brought in. And then scale, left click. G, dragging it down. Like I said, I want it more of a dome shape. It looks like a yurt. If it, uh, you know what a yurt is, it's a Mongolian structure that's quite mobile. All right, so what I'm doing is I am now changing to edge mode because what I want to do is select certain edges. 
Now, in this case, I'm going to select the top edge, and I did that by holding down the Alt and left-clicking the mouse. And I want to select the bottom edge as well, so I'll hold down the Shift, Alt, and left-click the mouse. And then that selects that loop. Now I want to, on the sides, where you can see the red line going through, which is the X axis, I'm going to hold down the shift and just select. So I'm not holding down the alt, just the shift. If I held down the alt, it would try and uh, select the whole loop. And I just want that section between. And hold down the shift and do the opposite. Now, I've got everything selected that I want to be selected. So what I do next is I left click the mouse because it's in edge mode comes up with the option where I can mark a scene and if I just deselect out of that by pressing a twice you can see a red line where I had placed or had selected those loops or edges and now it shows that that's where the scene is marked so what I can do next is I can go over to UV editing and for some reason, just got to set that up again. Oh. <clears throat> so if I press A to select everything, now in the latest build of uh, Blender, um, it comes out with you know, well, actually a reasonably good map. Um, however, um, I have made some changes to it and want to really show you how to go through uh, setting up maps yourself. So if I just press U unwrap, you can see that it has taken all the bits that I have and it's tried to find a good solution to putting them in there, but it actually does quite a terrible job. In this case, I can see distortion right here in the ceiling and the floors right against there. So what do I do about that? Well, I find the easiest way is I will go to face mode because I'm selecting the very top of the dome and control plus. It's the uh, addition uh, symbol on the numpad. Each control plus selects the next group along, next group along, so forth, and the minus will delete. So what I'm doing is I'm just selecting the top of the dome. And I want to go into top, so I have to be in the 3D viewing window here, the top view, and orthographic. So it's top orthographic, I hit 7 on the numpad. If for some reason it says perspective, um, you just need to hold your five on your numpad to swap between perspective and orthographic. We want to be an orthographic. Because what we do from here is we hit U and we project from view. And then that brings in a pretty decent circle, which I'm dragging off of my 2D area. Okay, then what I want to do is I actually want to hide so I press H and that hides hides that one. And I want to project from view again. So I'm going to hit U, project from view. This just stops any sort of distortions. Uh, I'm pressing A in here to select it all. G, drag it off of the area that I'm working on. And H again to hide. So we now have the dome hidden and we have the floor hidden. Now project from view is not going to work very well in this case because if I project from view with an object like this right along the edges here it's going to squish the texture or stretch the texture and I want it to unwrap nicely so what I'm going to do is just select the whole lot hit U rather than project from view I'm just going to do an unwrap now because it didn't unwrap it split up those two sections which is what I want um, however, for my map, I'm actually going to turn one of these walls. I'm going to turn it 90 degrees. So I'm going to press R, and in this case, minus 90. 
The reason why I'm doing 90 years, I've done this a few times uh, of late, and it seems that one of the walls, um, or even two of the walls, seem to come in upside down when I'm doing my texturing. But that's okay, because I can fix it. So what I'm doing here is I'm just bringing, in my 2D area here, I'm bringing my other wall close but not touching. So I'm leaving a bit of an island. And the reason why I'm doing that is that I will be able to, uh, this is a wall and this is a wall. And it's 90 degrees and I want them to sort of match. So I'm going to create textures over this one. And when I finish creating the textures on, on that wall to make a basic wall that is, I will then rotate that and place it here because these areas here are showing the faces and that's where the texture is going to sit. I'm going to change my pivot point over here into uh, to the 2D cursor because the next stage I want to do is I want to select everything that I've got there, which is just the walls, and scale it down so it fits within that 2D grid area or the UV map area. Okay, that's looking that's looking good. So now what I want to do is I want to bring back uh, that which is hidden on my uh, 3D viewing area. I can do that by pressing Alt H. So H hit everything, Alt H unhides. Then what I want to do is I want to make a decision here. So this is my Tomb of Doom when I go with a fantasy aspect usually. Um, I like having more detail on the floor where I might chuck down a magic circle or something like that. A lot of interesting stuff. Uh, when others have done exercises with me in the past, they might have added more detail to the roof, like a painted roof or a stained glass roof, something like that, which looks really, really cool. And they want more detail on that. So I'm deciding here which one I want more detail on and which one I want less. So I'll go with my normal floor. So I'm just had one thing selected there, or it doesn't even have to be selected. You can float your mouse over the top. And if I press L, it should select everything that is linked. So everything that's linked to that, because it's not touching other things, that's exactly what I want. I want it to do that. Now I did use a 3D cursor, sorry, the 2D cursor, because it's 2D space, to shrink everything down. So the pivot point was 2D, change the 2D cursor. In this case, I don't want to do that. If I start scaling, it's going to move away from the 2D or closer to the 2D cursor here. What I want to do is change it now. Its default was bounding box. If I use that, it comes in a lot neater. Or scales a lot neater, a lot more control. And what I'm doing is I'm just also making sure we have enough bleed room as well. So with uh, making UV maps, um, you want to fill as much space or optimize the space as much as possible. It is a normal way of working, seeing as we do both media and games for the media ones, if they're just doing it. Um, they're just doing movies or animations um, where they can already pre-render out an image. Then it's fine. You can you can do things in lots of different ways. With games, however, they render in real time through the game engine renderer. So you have to consider that when you're creating stuff. So with games, you try and optimize the space. The bigger the files. Uh, obviously, the slower the computer is going to run, and you're not going to have the best experience with the uh, exercise that you're doing. Right, so we have brought in or unwrapped the 3D object, put it onto a 2D plane. Now I'm going to show you what sort of things you can you can have a look at. At the moment, it's in solid view. We won't be able to see anything. I'm going to go to a material shader or viewport shading mode. And the next one across basically is a rendered mode. So it will show the effect of light upon the surface. If we stick with this one, it's a lot cleaner to see stuff at the moment until we really want to see what it looks like rendered. 
Okay, so I've selected that. It doesn't have a material yet. I don't have a generated one yet. So what I'm going to do is go over to here, image, new. Now, usually from here, I might bring in my, uh, you can bring in your image of when you've done the texture painting and all that sort of stuff. We haven't done that yet. Um, but you can bring in a new, which will just make it black at the moment if I just clicked OK and untitled the image. Um, this is great for maybe doing some hand painted work. Um, you can go, you can click that straight on and you can start painting away and creating maps in the hand painted style. Uh, but rather than do a blank at the moment, I'm going to show you what a UV grid looks like. So it's generated a UV grid. Now this thing has no material, so we can't see it displayed. We have to add the material. So I'll go to here to add a new material. And rather than just messing with the base color and start playing with it there, I can go to where it says base color, but click on the yellow dot instead and go to where it says image texture. From here, I can go to the drop down menu for the image and bring in the untitled. And as you can see, the untitled is the, the grid projected on the 3D model. So the beauty of it is, um, if I start moving it around, I might, you know, want to position something to align a little bit cleaner. I can do that here. It shows me quite well what everything looks like. Okay, but I choose this shape because it's it has a tiny bit of distortion in the texture, but it's fairly straightforward. So that's looking okay. What we're going to do is show you another one. So go to image, new, and this time I'll go to color grid and say okay. It's brought up a color grid. You haven't seen it changed here straight away because it need, you need to get through the list I've just generated. So it's untitled 0.001. If I click on that. Now the advantage is here. So that looks good. The advantages here is it gives you coordinates. So I can see C4, C4 is right there. On something as simple as this, it's not needed. Um, however, you might have something that's really complicated, a character that has lots of parts perhaps, and you need to find a belt buckle, and you might see it at B4, and yeah, right there it is, so you know where it is on your map where to texture. Okay. So that's looking pretty good from that point of view. However, I'm not using that texture either. So I'll go and get rid of that image. I'll change this one later. So far, we've done everything that we need to in preparation for the model ready for UV export. So we want to export this map. So what I'm going to do is go up to the top, sorry, here, where it says UV in the menu. I want to go down to UV and I want to export the UV layout. So it's right at the bottom there, click export the UV layout. This will give me a location or I can set up a location where I want to save off the file. So I'll just go to this folder for now because I'm doing something there and I will call this one pod or my tomb of doom underscore wire. I'm calling it wire because we're just going to set off a uh, wireframe which I can create my textures to mail from. So now that that's done, Another thing I want to point out here is the fill opacity. The fill opacity is at 0.25. What that means is that it's going to be translucent um, between the lines so you can see what's face and what's not face. In this case, I know what's the face and what's not the face. It's easy for me to work in uh, Photoshop if I take that fill opacity, take it down to zero. And another thing to consider here is your size requirement. So this is how large it's going to make the image. As you export it, 
1024 by 1024 is its default. If you are doing something for games, you might want to increase the size. Uh, no, sorry, in, in that case, you might want to decrease the size to uh, keep the um, keep the game more efficient by uh, reducing the size of things. Um, if you're creating something like for a movie, uh, you might want to really up the resolution. The higher you make the number, the more detail you can fit in. So the beauty about Blender is each one of these tabs throughout the whole lot can take mathematical formulas. So in this case, I wanted to really a lot of details into my next tomb of doom usually I keep it as default but i might want to in this case maybe times it by four i'm going to press enter and i can see 4096 is 1024 times four times okay so i can just put in mathematical formulas here That creates the um, the resolution that I'm looking for. So what I'm going to do now is just export that UV layout. Now, when it comes to this stage for Blender, it's now finished for now. Um, usually, a good time to save it. I've created lots of these, so I'm not going to save. I'm just going to minimise that. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to find where my wireframe is. Now I know where I put it. So it's just giving me a few seconds while I'm in the other screen looking for it. So I have found the location of it, which is here, Todd Wire. I'm gonna click on it and I'm gonna open with Photoshop. I'll slide this back out of the way. Probably don't need it. I'll just chuck it down. Close it down. At the moment, the Photoshop files taking a while loading. Which it has done now. I'm trying to drag it across. Okay. That for some reason that took a long time. Okay, maybe a bit hard to see, but the wireframe is there. Because um, we've got a checkered pattern in the background. Now, what I normally do here is I would name it wire and I'd padlock it straight away, lock that layer. It's always good to name your layers. So it's good to name everything. And when we get back to Blender here too, which I'll open up Blender right now. Uh, this at the moment is called Cylinder and I've got Materials, which is just called Materials.001. If I'm making a large scene, a huge project, you obviously want to start naming things. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a bunch of cylinders and materials and cubes and all that sort of stuff and you don't know what's what. What you can do is you can double click in that space. So I will call it Todd because it's my tumor doom. And those materials are going to leave because I'm not really going to do anything with them at the moment. And let me just minimize that. Okay. So I've brought in my wireframe. And now what I want to do is start building textures underneath it. Now, I do in the class usually go through and show us a bunch of different uh, texture libraries. So for instance, uh, it used to be CG textures. It's now textures.com. That's a good site. Uh, Ambient CG is another one I'd use, and Polygon. These are the three that I've basically been using in the last uh, few sessions. So, uh, what you could also do is I have um, got some texture files. I've got my own sort of texture library as well, which you've got a a bunch of stuff in there and I've got a bunch more stuff as well 
uh, in other locations. And from here, I can choose what I want my ground to be for this one or I think I have some medieval style stonework. That could be all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unzip this one. Not really happy on the color of that. I might change my mind. Um, don't want to take too long either. What I do is just go to a stone folder and cobble might be what I'm looking for. Okay, that's not looking too bad. I want to make sure that this thing is seamless though. So what I might do is I might duplicate the layer. And it comes up like this. And I say, okay, I'm keeping that in there just to make sure this is definitely not a seamless one by looks of it. Um, to make it seamless, I can go to filter, other, and there's offset. And the offset option, when I start dragging along the vertical, you can see the edge. So it's pushing the edge to the middle. And of course, it means the middle to the edge. So the edge will now wrap nicely in that direction. And then I'll move the horizontal as well. It seems to be working a lot better because I can't see the seam in it. It is working a lot better, but I'm going to bring. Let me see if I can move you out of the way. Here we go. I want to bring that really dark section here close to the middle too to deal with. And I'm going to say OK. Now, in the class, I show lots of different ways of uh, doing this. There's the heal tool, spot healing brush. So. So there's, there's one way of doing it that way. That's not quite the one that I normally use. Um, like that. As you notice, there wasn't quite painting in a straight line. Um, I could also change the brush as well to be a bit more of an uneven brush. This is sort of break out the pattern a little bit more. 
but it's just the healing ones. I can also use a clone stamp. I can find a selection. I was getting rid of that really strong pattern. Bit too close, it's repeating that too easily. That's working for my needs. Um, another technique, of course, is because I have it underneath, I have this one underneath, I can use the erase tool as well. If I find something that's looking a bit too chunky or a bit too repeated. So actually this is looking a bit repeated. I can use the erase tool as well. Feathering, um, not too bad actually, I might use the uh, let's soften that. Breaking that up a little bit. Okay, so that's looking all right. Um, so actually, this image is okay. Um, if I was erasing and all this stuff, of course, I'd flatten the image. Um, but in this case, it's fine. I just can drag it straight across into into this space. Is going on here? Ah, for some reason I've got a little tiny selection down here for reasons unbeknownst to me. That's what I was looking for. Okay, so there's my texture. I always take my wireframe above. Uh, just because it makes it really easy to see what I'm doing. In this space over here is where my floor is. Not that you can probably see it too clearly. And what I also teach in the classroom as well, um, when you're doing this exercise, uh, it's not wallpapering. I mean, I could just slap that there and say, yeah, yeah, floor's done. But really the rocks will end up looking massive in that space. I know from experience that they have to be shrunk down quite small because I'm doing an internal space and it would be we want to shrink down these things so it looks more realistic and they don't look like massive boulders all right so I'm just placing it there my wireframe's locked I'm, I'm happy about that I'm making sure of that and I'm going to go to clone stamp when I get to my clone stamp I can use the open and close brackets a lot of these tools is a quick shortcut um, keys for um, increasing and decreasing the size of your brushes. I'm going to use the clone stamp. So I hold down the Alt and left click near that corner and then line it up here. And I can see I've got a slight gap, so I have to do that again. I can use Navigator to get in a bit closer. If that helps with alignment. Usually I'm pretty good at this. I've done this for a few years, so. Get lined up. Here I am saying I was good at this. I usually am. Today, I'm working with broken glasses for a start. Oh, that's an excuse. There we go. That's better. All right, so now we're just clone stamping across. I can see the edge of my 
circle, my floor, along here from my wireframe. A bit hard for you guys to see at the moment, but you will see shortly. Okay, because I'm just chucking in the floor. Now you can see with this floor, even though I've turned into a seamless texture, it's repeating its pattern quite often. So later on, I'll go through and try and break that up a bit. interesting a little bit off there like I said it doesn't matter because I do have to go and clean it up anyway break up the pattern so this gives me a good opportunity to do that so I'm going to grab a section from here come over here get a few tabs from different locations just to break up that A little bit. Now the advantage of having a locked layer for your wire is I can go to the wire layer. I don't want to move it at all because they're the coordinates. But what I can do is I can use that to select certain sections. So in this case, I've selected um, outside of the faces and it's select all the outside. Then I can go to where I've just created a floor texture and hit backspace. And it has cleanly removed all of them. I also have um, obviously this section here I can do a uh, select inverse and use the erase tool in this case. I actually didn't need to uh, select inverse because there's nothing else on the screen. At the moment, this is the first texture, so it wasn't really needed, but just showing you that you can select a section and select an inverse again. So in this case, I have selected an inverse. This one I'll call my, it should, it should name everything, I've got ground or and then I'll add a layer above. And this one I'll call shadow floor. I have selected the inverse. I have gone to a new layer to do this one because what I want to do here is I want to create a shadow for the base of the floor. And I want to do it in such a way as If I make a mistake, something along those lines, I'm not painting directly on the floor, I'm painting on a layer above. It means I can switch it on and off, I can make changes, I can do all sorts of things. I will be switching my um, shadow layers and a few other uh, visual effect layers off later when I go and create a normals map from what I've created here. However, that's selected now, and now all I do is obviously not paint with the erase tool. All right, and just check my flow again. Okay, that's good. That's a bit better. So yes, I can see that I'm painting it in other areas, which later on I will get rid of. But for now, 
I'm just tapping near the edge there. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to shrink down my brush size as well. So I can get right near the corner here. Because this is where the floor will meet the walls. So I should be able to get a nice little bit of shadow in there. And if I wanted to, I'm just looking at that now, it's not bad. I do like the green. However, it could probably afford to be a little bit darker as well. So I can go to um, Hue and I can sort of darken it down a bit. Maybe even desaturate a little bit so it's a bit grayer or you bring the saturation up. You can even change the color of it as well. Uh, with a hue, in fact, coming down this way a little bit. It's actually matching the stone a bit, but I will keep it green. I'm going to cancel that. So that's one way. Uh, the other way is adjustment by your curves. And your curve looks like this. You can actually do it by color as well, red, green, or blue, or just the RGB altogether. So if I drop it down like this, it's going to start darkening it. I can actually a lot more detail or even make it sharper by going through a few different points adding a few different points that's looking very shadowish so I'll say okay I'm happy with that okay at this stage I'm going to create a new folder and in this folder I'm just going to call it ground so that Grab these parts here, put them into the folder. Um, I might as well make other folders while I'm at it. Another layer, another folder. And call walls. Folder, roof, More accurately ceiling because you're going to be on the inside. That's okay. Okay, it's really handy to work within the folders. Name your layers, all that sort of stuff. So I've got a, um, I've got a, uh, a nice sort of floor with the shadow. I have to remove the so that was at thirty percent. I have to remove the uh, shadow from these other things. I just keep working on things until I get some good effects on there. So, like I said, I usually chuck in the magic circle here. I might go through uh, texture libraries and look for, say, bones or cloth or material that uh, I can make look like it's just been discarded, like it's been discarded in the dungeon, and sort of uh, visual cues would be quite good. Let's see what I've got in here at the moment. I like said fabric. Um, that's more for a pattern for brushes. So I won't be using that one. Scroll. I've uh, got some scroll stuff. I might use that one. It's got a few blood marks on it. And I can open that one with Photoshop as well. It opens up in this whole new on your window there. All right, that's cool. Um, with this previous one, I made another copy because I turned it into seamless and I dragged from here off. 
For this one, say we've got a lot of stuff brought in here. That sometimes happens. I can uh, sometimes use the browse and bridge, which allows you to select lots of files at once and you can stack them up here. And then a uh, technique is once you start losing this one in a huge list, an easy way of fixing that is I can duplicate the layer. Duplicate the layer for this blood. Actually, I might just call it blood. Scroll. And in its destination for where I duplicate the layer, I can go to my Todd Y layer, hit OK. What that's done is it has placed it in there. And I want to chuck this. In my on my floor here somewhere. And I might do a transform on this one. So I'm going to free transform. And then in that I'm going to use a uh, distort. No, not distort. Skew. Hang on, no, it's warp. That's the one I'm thinking of. Okay, so I'm going to use the uh, Navigator to zoom in a wee bit. So I'm now going to distort my scroll so it doesn't look like it's just plonk there nice and neat. So it looks like it's, I want it to look like it's been dropped. That's looking okay. Um, but what I do is still to neat in sections. So I'm going to maybe chop some bits out of it. So I go to my erase tool, which is quite a large brush at the moment, so I'll scale that down. And um, I'm actually going to look at the brushes for it. So I can go to Windows, anything that I can't see there, I can click on and it will show up. All right, and uh, under the arrays here, I might choose something, a little bit of scruffiness to it. That's a bit. I might go with that one, I think. Okay, so what it's done is it's changed from the eraser to that when I change the brushes. That's a little bit better. Uh, that's good. Okay, let's go to some brush settings here.
Okay, that looks okay. Let's break that up a little bit there. Take a few nips out. And I could go so far as to put runes or something on there as well. Um, let me just back off again and have a look. Okay, not too bad. Okay, so just checking a little bit of an effect there. Got my blood scroll sitting there now. It's looking pretty good. What I might do is um, stop the recording here because really um, all you're doing is just selecting a bunch of different textures that you think would work really well. You'd be chucking it in there in the different locations, building up your map. And it's after that stage that we've got to go through uh, reapplying it back to our 3D model. So I'll just pause it here and come back when I've got something. So I'm going to start, uh, I've started recording again. Um, what you can see here, inside here is just, I've uh, created a texture map. I'm fairly happy with it. I want to save it off as an albedo, 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 which is a color map. What I might do is actually switch that off at the moment um, because I might want to add that later as an, an emission. Um, so I have in my glowing circle. Uh, pretty happy with that at the moment. Okay, so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is go file. I'm going to save a copy. For some reason, Photoshop of late um, has limited certain options uh, unless you copy off. So I don't know what's in the settings there, but it's okay. So pod this one. Albedo, Albedo, I'm probably spelling it wrong, Albedo, I used to just call it colour map, but basically it's an Albedo, um, I might check this in here for now, I'm just going to save my colour map there, and then I'll go back to uh, Blender, alright, so Go back to Blender here. Okay, so what we had set up before was just these materials that um, were showing the grid. Right now, what I'm going to do is bring in. Actually, I'll, I'll select everything. I'll bring in the image. So, so I'm image open and open stage two. See Albedo. Open that. All right, so it showed up here, and I need to select it from here. I'm just checking, yes, my walls, and thought of facing the right way. Okay, good. Okay, at the moment, you're seeing uh, flat geometry on this 
uh, object. So made the object, hadn't shaded it smooth yet. So I'm going to right click and shade smooth. So in the materials that is now attached, what I'm going to do next is um, I'm going to uh, select everything, Alt N, and I'm going to recalculate inside. So what I want to want to do is set up a space inside here. There's a few other things I have to mess around with. Uh, for instance, the specularity of this. I might make a spec map for this later, but for now, uh, specularity, I'll take down zero. Sorry for the disturbance. I had to uh, leave and I'm back again. Okay, so I have uh, placed the albedo texture inside. I can see we've got a large gap here. What you can do in uh, Blender as well is you can paint in Blender as well. So I could, I could, I could paint that seam out. Um, so let's just go to texture paint. Yeah. And this is going to see what I can do. So I'm going to use the clone stamp and I'm going to hold down uh, the control rather than alt because this is Blender. It's not Photoshop. I see a little bit of repeatedness there, so I'll just break it up a little. Now, one thing you need to remember is that if I saved off this blend file now, I would have lost that fix, that seam. So I always have to go over here to image and save. And that'll save that source image. Another thing that I normally do as well is I'll put on file, go down to external data. And if I click on automatically pack resources, down the bottom there it says that it's packed one file. It's packed this image into the blend file. Blender um, usually has absolute addressing when it comes to this sort of thing. So it uh, will look fine here. If I go to take it home and open it back up again, I'll open it up and everything will be magenta. That's because it's missing the texture. Just by going through that little thing of packing the external data file prevents that from happening. And it's not looking too bad. I've got quite a bit of sheen. I'll get out of texture paint now because really that was the only fix I needed to do at this point in time. And I'll go back to my modeling. Here, because there's a couple of things that I've been doing with the students so far. It's like the textures on there, you can't see it at the moment because it's in solid view in the modeling. If I go over to here, you can start to see that it is applied. And if I switch over to the next one, this is with lighting data. So this is just, as mentioned before, um, it's just a texturing. So you can uh, work on your texturing without any issues, but this is what it will look like when it's rendered when light is involved. What we're going to do for this exercise is we're going to move the camera. This is the virtual camera inside. So Shift S, what I'm going to do is with Shift S is I can move the cursor. 3D cursors come off its uh, central world point. I can either go back to where it says uh, cursor to world origin, that'll go right in those crosshairs, or um, cursor to selected, seeing as I have the tomb of doom selected already and the origin point is right at the base of the floor. I can then go and select my camera, shift S, do the same thing. Selected to cursor, and that has just snapped the camera right inside the middle there. Uh, a couple of things I will change about that though is I'll zero out the rotation on the Z axes. 
uh, and on the x axis, I will make it 90. So it's sitting like that. Um, I want it to be facing. Oh, it is facing the door. Okay, good. Yep, it's facing the door. So G, Z, raise it up. We hit zero on the numpad. I'm looking through and I can see the door. That looks fine for what I want to do. I have, uh, I can adjust the camera here. Um, I have done two modules before in the past where they've just been a quite a simple game of uh, ghostly things coming through the wall and you fight them off. Um, but lately I've been playing around with uh, creating uh, 360 images as well. For that, I need to move off into, um, instead of being in EV, go to Cycles to set up a 360 camera. Okay, but I'll go back to EV for now because my lighting's not in there, so I need to move my lighting. Shift S, flips it to cursor, that goes right in the middle there. And what I want to do now is G, middle mouse button, and drag it up somewhere like that. As you can see now, there's lots of light. So that light source needs to be dropped down. That's a little bit better. Okay, so with this camera, um, I will quickly go and set that up. Okay, so I go to Cycles, and um, I might even try going with the experimental here. I will leave that as that for now. All right, so with the camera, with the camera here in uh, Cycles Render Engine, I can get to Panoramic. And once I'm in Panoramic, I've got to change from Fisher Eye to Equa Rectangular. Now the Equa Rectangular, so let's just have a quick look through the camera. As you can see, the echo rectangle has done something a little bit different. Now, what it's done is it's created a 2D representation of what will be wrapped into a 360 view. So I have been playing around with things like, um, and this is uh, coming up for the expo, so this is what we'll be doing right now. So if I drag this in here, for you to have a look at, all right, I have been setting up uh, this 360 view. This is one of the students' work. As you can see, it's uh, Artist Zuber, which was his first texture work, which he says he's pretty proud in his little quote. And he says, I had a blood nose when making this. And money. he just has splattered blood everywhere, which is cool. All right, so with the cooler, it's a 360 application program. So this is something that I'm setting up, just saying uh, the Tomb of Doom exercise for texturing 3D models, um, saying this is just creating their first works. This is going to be a portal maybe to the tutorial that we're actually um, recording right now. Um, and then we go through and we basically are looking at, as the students uh, develop them, so uh, Brendan Lim, has created this really funky uh, skeleton room. Um, he's got a YouTube channel as well, which if I click on that, will take you to his YouTube channel. So he wanted to chuck that in his room, which was, I thought, fair enough. And we have Arush, who um, has handed in his file. And there's a couple others to go. And then I'll just click on the next room to bring that up. Um, this is quite cool to look at in uh, the VR with the VR headsets. So looking forward to setting that up at the expo that's coming up. Okay, so I showed that. 
All right, this is how you can get that effect because it's the echo rectangular. There's a couple other things that I need to change. So the echo rectangular um, thing, you can see where some some of the edges are sort of squished and distorted. That's because when it's wrapped around in a full 360, it, it looks like what you've just seen. Um, so that's looking pretty good, but I do need to adjust um, Do you need to adjust the seem to have lost my sidebar by mucking around, so I'm going to have to. Uh, See what I did there, that's a bit weird. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just go this way instead. Um, so really, the the uh, to make it work, the, the resolutions here need to be within the correct format. So an echo rectangular is, it's basically uh, twice as wide as it is high. And I might want to have a look at resolutions there. So if I'm going for a uh, maybe a 4K 360 resolution, resolution. So I'm just typing this in. There are. So for four thousand resolution there, which means that would be two thousand. It's all set up properly, it's still on cycles, that's good. Now there's a few more things that I do I obviously want to do here. So firstly I'm going to select the um, select the team of doom and I'll go to my shading window. Okay, so in my shade I should have um, node wrangler switched on. If I, yes I do. Um, by selecting that and hitting control T, what it did is it spat out the uh, mapping coordinates and the UV. It's still coming from a UV map. And so this is very controllable. Um, if I had something with a moving texture in that, this would be very useful. Uh, this is going to be a static one, so it's not moving. That's fine. And then I'll leave it as it is right now. Um, but what I do want is to create a normals map. So if I opened up uh, Photoshop again, I can go through and start switching off stuff that I don't want to be turned into a normal map. So that would be stuff like the shadows. I don't need the shadows. Uh, I will leave the blood scroll. And the reason why I'm leaving the blood scroll and the mat is that if I don't, when I generate them, the stones would show up. And that would not quite look right. But one thing I do need to switch off is the blood. And the reason why I'm switching off the blood splatters and the shadows is that they do not require to um, have that uh, bumpy look. In fact, it would look quite wrong if it. I suppose somewhere I've got to name it. This is why it's important to name things. That's the one. 
All right, I think that will. I think that will do. All right, so what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm basically going to select all the visible, all the visible layers. I think there's anything in here that shouldn't be at the moment. Right, I think that's it. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to right click, select them all, duplicate the layers. I'm duplicating all those layers. And then, of course, they're all put together here, which is handy because what I want to do is merge those layers now because I still have everything else in separate layers. It's just this last copy here, which I will actually put above that. I will then duplicate again. Right, so I'm saving this that I can use it in other, other areas. This one here, I'm going to go to filter 3D normal map so from the structure i made i'm going to create a normal map now it is saying that it is uh photoshop isn't going to uh, keep this feature going because uh, adobe has bought out substance painter and that's what i'd be taking um students through next time this is where you actually do a lot of your 3d texture artwork uh, in the future it is a handy tool and very useful okay so photoshop currently has this but like i said that that is going by the wayside because they have other tools to do that job uh, this is basically creating a map like this which is what i want are you happy with it that's quite interesting i didn't get any detail show up there but that's okay it's up out of the way all right this um creates a rgb map of uh it's like um it's information that dictates how the light on the surface of the 3d model is going to look okay so i think i'll just uh save this off and show you instead save as also on the computer where is the same and last stuff and that's what I meant before by saving a copy as it's like for some reason limited range it used to be like that so I'll save off a copy allows me now to drop down to my PNG which is what I want I think I was saving actually I obviously didn't save it here stage twos I think is where I was starting to save that yep okay so rather than Todd wire I'll now call this Todd form because it's my normal map Right, and have my caps lock on. Warm. Okay. I'll save that one off. I also have in this, I'll turn this one off. Ah, let's finish doing that. I'll turn this off for a sec to show you that I have, uh, where are you? We should have named it this one. So what I'm going to do instead with this one is I'm going to actually switch off everything else. As well, no, I needed. Oh, no, that's right, that's there, got that there. Uh, it's in folders, so I should could have just collapsed the folder. And hidden that could have done that and that which would have been made more sense but anywho it's me getting carried away with a few things all right I think that's good all right everything else is switched off need that on need that off okay 
because this is going to be my emissions map. I want an emissions map. So I'm going to go file. I'll just go straight to save a copy. So the computer PNG is good. Go back to my stage two. And this will be my Todd commit. Now I can keep going with things. Um, so like with this particular map here, I could go through and uh, maybe duplicate it again and try and pick up what I want to be specular highlights and stuff like that and make a spec map and so on. Uh, I, I could keep going and create stuff. At the moment I'm not going to. Uh, I'll be just going to go back to here to show that um, I've created now a bump map. Let's go to the render so as we can have a look. Shift D, I'm duplicating that panel there. That panel there is the texture. Now it's just duplicated that one, so I need to open again to create to get a new one. And I want to grab the normals. So I'll grab the normals, bring it down here. I can add uh, another node in between here and the normals. And I also need to make sure the coordinates are the same plugged in. So I'm going to plug that in there. The vector, I need to make another duplicate. This is going to be my emit. Glowy. For the particular uh, work that I'm doing at the moment, they are basically just still shots. But I can animate an emission strength um, if I'm doing an animation. And that way I can check that on the timeline and I can get the magic circle to sort of pulse. That would be pretty cool. If I was in. Um, no, I'm not going to. I'm not going to muddy the waters by talking about doing different things. Basically, I'll do a quick render of the image. Well, I say quick, it's actually not going to be quick. Um, cycles is going to take a lot of calculations, especially if I'm doing something that is um, a high quality. So you can see the magic circle. Uh, you are basically standing directly inside the magic circle. That'll be your view anyway, because that's where the camera is, the 360 camera. Um, and this is what I meant about the distortion that comes to a cross. But as you can see, it's, it's bending things to fit on a flat plane, which will then, in the other program, recognize it as a equal rectangular 360, and it will wrap it but it will take some time to render out. So I guess that's probably where we might stop at the moment. I'm just saying uh, that in our exercise, we go to Photoshop, we can just create different things, different layers, different effects, and we can keep generating different maps for now. Um, like I said, very shortly, probably the next iteration of uh, Photoshop won't have the feature of doing the height maps and the normal maps. Um, because it's all just going to be handled in um, in Substance Painter and Substance Designer, that sort of stuff. So I'm pretty happy with that at the moment. So I might just save off that file. And this time it'll save as a uh, Photoshop file, which is what I want. Uh, 
was putting that one in stage two. So I just keep putting that in stage two for now. So I'll save that. So down the bottom here is saying how much it has rendered at the moment, which at the moment is really nothing. It's zero percent. It's got a lot of um, operations to go through, um, but hopefully we'll have that really nice looking blood splattered of magic room. So. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. I'm just rendering this one out. It's going to take some time. So I might as well stop the recording here.